haven't been welcomed, you are in the month of June. It is June 2. Welcome to it. It is summertime, um, but we don't have our Wednesday night dinner and Bible study, so don't show up on Wednesday. Um, there's always one. I said this on Wednesday when I announced it. There's always that one person that I'll go meet you in the parking lot and say, hey, glad you're here, but go home um, or come on over. I don't know. Just we're not meeting. Um, that being said, let me, let me jump into, we just wrapped up a series through uh, uh, Proverbs. We spent eight weeks just kind of journeying through different Proverbs. And, and after um, I read, after I read on my own time Proverbs 6 in preparation to then preach Proverbs 6, there was just a, a, a spot in there that really grabbed my heart and grabbed my attention where it, it said in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, look at the ant, you sluggard. See how the ant stores up in summer to prepare for the autumn and the winter. And I thought, fascinating how the ant is so thoughtful enough. Now, the ant is storing food for the winter time, but I, I, I want to be doing the same thing. I want us to be doing the same thing. So for June and July... We are going to just have this season that we're calling uh, Summer Store Up. Now, hear what we are not saying. In the Summer Store Up, we are not saying that we want to store up for ourselves or or we don't want to hoard God's Word, the Bible, our finances. We don't want to hoard and, and hide and lock away that we keep it to ourselves. That's not what Summer Store Up is. What summer store up is, would we rather prepare ourselves? Would we, in June and July, open up God's Word, take in and store up for ourselves, prepare, knowing that life is going to happen this fall? Um, If you're tracking with politics, politics is going to happen this fall. And so are we ready for it as Christians and How should we respond to this season? Uh, um, The new school year. Hannah and I are about to, our Ella is a freshman. And and so it's a new season for us to have someone in high school. And so I want intentionally to store up, prepare myself as it pertains to God's word, God's word for that new season for my family. Some of you are feeling the same thing. Some of you are moving this summer. And so um, in the short time that we have before you leave, We want to store up, prepare from God's Word as you enter into that new season. There are so many other circumstances that are going to happen that we don't even know about or that you are planning for. So in June and July, would we open up to God's Word and prepare ourselves for what's to come? So that's what Summer Store Up is all about. We're going to kick that off next week. But I just want you to know and maybe even be prayerful prayerful now that God would prepare you, prepare your family, prepare our church family for what's to come, for what God has for us. And so, deal? Can we make that deal? Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay, Okay, because at first you were like, no, I don't know. But now all of you gave me a thumbs up, and I recorded that in my mind, so you have no excuse. But before that, I think we need to also see a snapshot biblically of God's church. Um, I also want to take time today as God's church to uh, take the Lord's Supper. We're going to do that in a little bit, and and we have some volunteers that are going to pass the elements out to you before we get out, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Um, And so if you would, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. It's going to be up on the screen also, but Acts chapter 2 I want us to read five verses or so, and then we're going to break down. We're going to ask the question why and break down that passage to answer the question that we ask why. Acts chapter 2. Let me just give a little plug. Um, Frank Scott teaches a Bible study. Uh, He has a little Bible study class that meets on uh, Sunday mornings uh, about 9.15, 9.30 until this hour. Um, they are kicking off a study through all of Acts, um, so from Acts 1 to Acts chapter 28. Um, and so uh, if you want more 
uh, commentary and deeper study. Frank is the guy to go to on Sunday mornings, but I just wanted to give us a snapshot of God's church then and now. So read with me Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and it'll be up on the screen here. It says this, So they devoted themselves whenever it was convenient on their busy calendars. They came together on time, but at different times. They walked in an air-conditioned building and found a comfortable seat. They nodded to one another, other people in their row. Some offered a smile, but they hardly looked at each other again. Instead, they fixed their eyes on the stage. They stood, some of them sang. They sat and watched and listened to someone speak for a while until they prayed and ate a small snack. As soon as they were finished eating and drinking, they got out of here as fast as possible in order to beat the traffic. Then they waited to do it again the next week or whenever it would work again with their schedule, and they called it church. Okay, that's not Acts 2, 42 to 47. Uh, I actually heard a pastor read that, and I word for word took it from him. Because how often, I know we laughed, and it was pretty funny myself. I was bawling the first time I heard it. How often do we make that church? How often are we guilty in finding ourselves comfortable and making that church? How many of us have been in this like me since the fourth grade? And that's what church has become. Now, none of those things are wrong. Singing and friends, I love hearing you sing and praise and worship God. And praise God for the air conditioner. Like we were, thank you for amening that. Like we will not turn the AC off. As a matter of fact, I get here early to make sure it's on and working. I, uh, almost all of you know that the last three weeks I've been commuting uh, back and forth to Waco. I, uh, been ta- I've been taking a class uh, at Truett Seminary and it required me to be on campus and so for uh, seven back and forth trips on I-35, I can drive I-35 blindfolded now. Um, you laugh, but there's a couple times I just, just kidding, I didn't do that. I highly don't recommend driving blindfolded on I-35. Um, it's actually the dangerous highway in our country. Did you know that? Yeah, so say your prayers every time you get on I-35. Um, But I noticed something on I-35. There's these new digital signs, especially from Round Rock to Waco. There's these really nice new digital signs in the middle of the highways facing both directions. And it's a digital sign. Like, you're not supposed to be on your phone. Why do they want you reading a digital sign? Like, I feel like that's just as dangerous. But anyway, I digress. The message on the sign for the last three weeks that I've read over and over and over and over again says this. You are already in Texas. Slow down. You are already in Texas. Slow down. Amen, right? As we read the real passage here in a little bit, I want us to do just that. Slow down. It's hard to slow down today, isn't it? Like, you know your schedule. You know what's on tap for the rest of the day, the rest of the week. This summer season, the the next two months, June and July, like, if I could just petition us to do one thing, it's to slow down and to do everything in our power to eliminate whatever it is that we need to eliminate to carve out time to slow down. To, to slow down long enough to see, to know, and realize God at work. To slow down long enough to, to ask Him to work. To slow down long enough to, to lament, to cry out and say, God, help me. But it only is going to happen if we slow down. And so as we turn to the real Acts 2, 
42 to 47, that's the posture, is slow down. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Just checking that the real one's up. (laughs) To the breaking of the bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Amen. Why? It's a familiar passage, right? Maybe to many of us, this is a familiar snapshot of a, of a real time and place thousands of years ago that, that, that happened with what then transpired, springboarded what we are now, the church. Like, this is the church gathered in Jesus' name. But why? Like, what happened for them to operate in such a way? What happened inside of them and outside of them that, that, that charged them or gave them the desire to do it then? And here's a big question. What is it going to take for us to have the same desire for this Acts 2, 42 to 47 to happen today? I, I just want to be honest. I want this here today. I'm going to say it again so that you know, like, my agenda as pastor of Alma Heights Baptist Church is here. I desire Acts 2, 42 to 47 as it is in heaven here today now and moving forward. But what's it going to take for us? I think there's really three things. It's going to take. And so I want us to see those three things. So we're, we're going to jump through a few passages of Scripture. Some of it will be up there. Actually, all of it, I provided it up there. Um, and so if you want to take notes of these things, please take note of it, but also look up on the screen. So, so this is what it's going to take to answer this question. Number one, Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Number one, they had the power and we need the power. So Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says this. And again, it may be a familiar passage. And here's what it's going to take with them having the power and us having the power. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my, say it with me, witnesses. Okay, let's, let's try it again. I'm going to read it. And then when it comes to the word, let's, let's say it. But when you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then look at verse 9. He was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Jesus died a real death. He was put into a tomb and then burst back to life escaped that tomb, and here he is now showing himself to his closest followers, the 12, and and an even closer, larger group of followers as the 120, defined in Acts chapter 1 and 2. We see that number, and we're going to see another number here, 3,000 in just a bit. Jesus is showing up, and he's just told them, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit in order for you to be my witnesses, which a witness tells of what they've seen to the people around them. That is you, Jesus talking to his closest followers, and that is us talking to us today. Like this is you and your experience too. And it's interesting because verse 9 tells us after he said that he's taken up 
as he said he would go back up and a cloud hid them from the sight. And we're not going to read, but if you want to read the rest of Acts 1, it is so brilliant because um, those disciples there, the 120, are caught looking up, wondering, just like you and I, what just happened? And we know true story because if you read the rest of Acts chapter 1, um, Jesus then sends two angels down because they're only staring at the clouds after he left. And the clouds are like, or the clouds, the angels are like, friends, why are you looking up? He's going to come back in the same way that he left. He's going to come back the same way. So go do what he told you to do. Would we be people, and this may come across offensive, and I'm not sorry, stop looking at the clouds. If we become people who follow Jesus and just stare in the clouds for him to come back, we've lost our purpose. Like if Genesis to Revelation Um, God spoke life into being and set it into motion and gave purpose to man and woman in the garden. And and then in Revelation 22, um, um, at the end of of the chapter, there's this, come, Lord Jesus, come. And everything in between is this um, men and women and creation groaning for Jesus to come back again. Do you ever feel that because of who it is you are and what it is that we face? We're, we're groaning, heaven help us send Jesus back because of you can fill in the blank, right? And, and so because of us feeling that way, we just stare at the clouds, waiting, waiting, hoping. And, and we're reminded, church, but you will receive pain. And he gives them direction. In verse 8, he says, um, in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, which is extremely interesting. If I could just take a quick moment here. Um, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Significant because, um, do you remember what just happened to Jesus in Jerusalem? They killed him. They hate Christ followers in Jerusalem but I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to be a witness to the people that don't really like you right now. Uh, I want you to go to all Judea, which seems safe at the time, right? Then I want you to go to Samaria. You know the significance behind Samaria? These Jewish individuals, these 120 Jewish individuals who are now Christ's followers, despise the Samaritans. So um, I want you to go to the people who hate you. I want you to go to Judea. And then I want you to go to the people that you don't like. You can name them, can't you? Yeah, I want you to go to them too. And then if it wasn't hard enough or confusing enough, I want you to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Those places that you can't even place or name on a map, I am sending you there. Now, often we think about it then because they, it, this was a Middle Eastern, first century Middle Eastern context. They had no clue about the world around them, right? And we think, like, that's, this was mind-blowing for them. But I want it to also be mind-blowing to us that we have no clue the call and purpose that God might have for us to send us to one of those places that's not even on a map or even on the radar for us to be a witness. That's a scary thing to think about, but God, use us. Because he says, with my power, you are a witness to places where people hate you, to places where you hate people, and to places that you don't even know about yet. Because with my power, you are witnesses. That's happening with the early church, and we need to know that, and we need to stop looking at the clouds and operating just like that today. Number two. Number two comes from Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Number two, we see that God's people were then united and today need to be united. 
We must be united. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 1, verses 14. They all join together. They all join together. From Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, you see that repeated over and over. They join together. Do you remember the prayer in John 17? If you don't remember, let me remind us. Uh, uh, Jesus prayed for his followers to be, God, would they be united just like you and I are united, making us one? Would they also be one? Friends, we must move as one. And this isn't just exclusive to Alamo Heights Baptist Church. This is exclusive to every believer in Jesus Christ that we move as one. So it is fantastic, it is awesome that we are Alamo Heights Baptist Church, that we are a, a church of people gathered in His name. But would we think so far beyond these walls as um, other friends family members and co-workers that are members at other churches that we move together as one united in Jesus Christ. Let's finish 114 of Acts. They all join together constantly, and this is what unites them, in prayer. Along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, they were one. And then look what happens when they're united together. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 4 says this. When the day of Pentecost came, which, just side note, two Sundays ago was Pentecost Sunday. So it marks 50 days after Easter. And so that's this moment here, 50 days uh, after the resurrection of Christ. When the day of Pentecost came, they were what? All together in one place because they were united, they were unified, they were in step. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house that they were staying in. 120 people in a house in the sound of a brilliant hurricane force wind shows up. There's no wind, but the sound of it shows up. Then look what it says. They saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What would happen if that broke out today? If we looked around and what looks like tongues on fire are over each and every one of us, what would you do? <sighs> like, 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 I don't know. Like, what's our reaction in that moment? And because... In chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, You will be my witnesses when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's exactly what's happening. In different languages, in their own languages, they began to speak, witness, give the gospel message of what just happened with Jesus in his death. Let me take it back. In what just happened in his life and then his death his burial, and his resurrection in different languages is being spoken with the, the sound of wind and the tongues of fire. It's no wonder if you read in Acts chapter 2 in this account, those unbelievers that are there watching this take place, these people are drunk and it's only 10 in the morning. That's the only way to explain it to an unbeliever. They must be inebriated because this is wild, right? Peter speaks up. In Acts chapter 2, Peter speaks up. Men, women of Galilee, we are not drunk. Uh, we are witnesses to you today of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. And the power that we have now in being witnesses, being those who share the good news, the gospel message of Jesus. That's what's happening. They had the power. We must have the power. They were united. We must 
be united. And then number three, look at Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 41. Number three is kind of threefold. So if you're taking notes, I'm sorry, this is going to be wordy, but it's threefold. Number three, they left their sin, they came to Jesus, and they became the church. They left their sin, they came to Jesus, and they became the church. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 41. When the people heard this, when the people heard Peter's message, or when they heard Peter's explanation and witness to what was happening on this Pentecost day, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what do we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we go uh, and finish this passage, um, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Have you ever been cut to the heart, and is your heart cut today? Meaning, the Holy Spirit convicted them in such a way that they are asking, what do I do with this? The conviction of the Holy Spirit to us today, what do we do with Jesus? Like, I can't fully wrap my head, wrap my heart around faith in Jesus Christ, but I know that it is doing something inside my heart and inside my mind. What do I do with this? Have you ever felt that? Do you feel that today? My prayer and hope is that, yes, that's where you have been or where you're at today. And for Jesus' sake, would you respond as Peter says, repent and believe, which means stop walking away and walk back to Jesus. Be baptized, which then offers us the the physical representation of us dying to our sin by going into the water of our baptismal right here, but then not staying there, coming up out of the water. It's the newness of life that we get to live in, in relationship with Jesus. What do we do? That's what you do with this, is you walk back to Jesus, and you are baptized to to de- declare to the world your newness of Jesus Christ. Look at what he says next. This promise, if you hear anything, especially for the parents in the room, the grandparents in the room, family members, neighbors, co-workers that we could think about, this promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off. If you're wondering today who Jesus is for, there it is. It's for you. He's for you. He's for your children. And He's for all who are far off. Because Romans 8, Paul tells us, there's no one too far off. As a matter of fact, there's nothing, Paul says, that can separate us from the love of God that's found in Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us. For all whom the Lord our God will call, look what it says next, with many other words, Peter warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Far too often, on, in, in 2024, we say, man, uh, things five years ago were, aren't as corrupt and bad as they are today. Now, things may be a little different than five years ago, but think about what Peter is saying in this moment. 2,000 years ago, save yourself for this corrupt generation. We're saying the same thing today. The generation that we live in is wicked corrupt. So save yourselves which tells us that the message of the gospel then is relevant and the message of the gospel today is still relevant for us. And that's what saves us from a corrupt generation. 
Look what happens next, friends. Those who accepted his message were baptized. They repented, they were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. From Acts 1, 120 people. To Acts 2, at the end of Acts 2, 3,000 plus. Why did they gather together? Why did they make and mark out time to, to adhere to the apostles' teaching? Now, we think too hard about this, right? Acts 2 um, tells us that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Well, we, we automatically think of, okay, what, what, what Bible study, what book were they reading? What, like, what um, Bible app study were they getting reminders of? No, none of that. They were just listening to the power of the Holy Spirit and the witnesses. They were hearing Peter, James, and John give account to Jesus in his life and his death and his resurrection and his mission going forward. It sounds easy enough. We, we can share that with those around us, with those that are in close proximity to us, can't we? And we have the benefit to opening then, opening our Bibles and showing them in Scripture. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans, Romans 8, and all of its brilliance. We can recite John 3.16, for God loved the whole world that He sent His one and only Son. And those who believe won't just have life today, will have life forever in relationship with Him. Why did they do that? Why did they meet together and eat together and have pickleball palooza with pizza? Like, why did they do these things? Why do we do these things? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because they were unified. Because we are unified. And number three, and most important, because they left sin behind and they drew near to relationship as they came to Christ. That's what allowed them to become the church. Then and for us today. We become Jesus' church not because we are situated at 6501 Broadway. That's just a perk that we get to have and experience together. We become the church because we leave sin, we come to Christ. Would we take full advantage of that today? Again, just a little bit, we're going to hold in our hand a, a cracker and a cup of grape juice, which does not do justice to what it signifies. That Jesus' body was broken so that our brokenness would be healed. Jesus' blood was shed so there would no longer be penalty or debt of the sin that we have encountered and will. Friends, that changes things for us, doesn't it? It should. It changes the way we interact with one another. It changes our marriages. It changes the way we parent. It changes the way we operate at our, at our workplace, at our school campus, and within the neighborhood. And so, um, as we take the elements here in a little bit, would you leave behind the old self, the sin that we get so easily entangled in? And would we walk out of here today and operate as we store up this summer as one who is a witness with his power. And so um, um, some, some friends are going to pass out the elements and when you grab it, would you just spend a time maybe reflecting, maybe in prayer, maybe you grab the hand of the person next to you and just, just think about what this means for you and how you move forward. If they pass out these elements, would you spend some time reflecting and praying?